I am uh, embarking upon, began last week, uh, embarking upon talking about what I call, like to call the seven hallmarks of Anglicanism. While it is true that it's very difficult to give a clear definition of what Anglicanism is, uh, which is really sort of a strange thing in and of itself, uh, while that is true, as John Westerhoff said, if you want to know what the Episcopal Church believes about something, come and see. We are a community that gathers around an altar. We are a community that has common worship, much more than common dogma. We are what's known as a non-doctrinal church. And yet, having said that, there are, I think, some things that you can point to that are marks of the Anglican Church. They aren't necessarily exclusive to the Anglican Church. Many other churches would have uh, much of the same thing to say. Perhaps not all together might be the difference. Uh, you know, the IRS has uh, all sorts of things that are, that are sort of ambiguous, that they have tests for them. It's like what establishes you as being self-employed if, how do you determine for tax purposes if you're self-employed or whether you're employed by someone? There's a whole list, I think they're 12 or 16 or something, uh, different tests that the IRS uses to establish whether or not you are self-employed. You don't have to meet all of them to be self-employed, but you have to meet some of them and nobody really knows how many. It's just sort of some, uh, enough. And so, uh, if you don't meet any of them, you are clearly not self-employed. And if you meet all of them, you are clearly self-employed. And somewhere in the middle, it sort of emerges. And I think maybe we could say the same thing about seven hallmarks of Anglicanism. I also need to say, as we, as we get into this, is that um, this is... I haven't read this in a book. I just made these up. <laughs> um, they're not... The, 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 the realities aren't made up. They are really true. But there's no one who has said these are seven, these seven hallmarks of Anglicanism. They're just what I think of as being hallmarks of Anglicanism. There might be nine. There might be 40. I don't know. These are just some that I have come up with. This is according to Joe Reynolds, so be warned. We dealt with the first one. We talked a lot about the first one last week. The Anglican Church is Catholic. I'm not going to go back over all of that, but the Anglican Church is Catholic with a capital C as well as a little c. It is Catholic. It is not Roman Catholic, which we would say is the Catholic Church that's centered in Rome. It is Anglo-Catholic. The Catholic Church historically centered in England. If you have been following this talk, that we have this, this journey that we have been on for the past six months or so, I hope you realize that the centering of that church in England, the church we now call the Anglican Church, the centering of that church in England goes far back in history, far beyond Henry VIII and the English Reformation. It has been a unique Catholic expression of the Christian faith since its very beginning. It has always been a unique expression of the Catholic faith, even before the Reformation, before there was a formal split from Rome. We would say that there are other Catholic faiths in the world. Primarily, all of the Orthodox faiths. Anything that's a such and such an Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox, any of the Orthodox faiths are all Catholic. They hold the same faith and they hold the same order of the church that has been handed down from generation to generation. The distinctions among the Catholic faiths are not matters of essential theology. 
They are not matters of essential that are essential to the faith. Rather, they are unique traditions, ways of expressing the faith, and ways of practicing worship. <coughs> In fairness, it needs to be said that the Roman Catholic Church would not agree with what I'm saying. <laughs> this is not something that you will hear if you go to this same class at a Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. They would say officially that the Catholic, the English Church separated itself from the true Catholic faith when it separated itself from the authority of the Pope. But when you really press the question, when you really push on it, the differences, the causes of that separation are about authority and structure rather than theology. We will come to this eventually before June the 3rd, I promise. We will come to this, but when you really start looking at what all Catholic faiths believe about sacrament, it's all the same thing. When I was coming along in the Episcopal Church in my confirmation class when I was 16 years old, adult confirmation, a great difference, distinction was made between transubstantiation and the doctrine of real presence that Roman Catholics believe in transubstantiation and Episcopalians believe in the doctrine of real presence. If you want to push on that, which we will a little bit, you will find that they mean exactly the same thing. And most Roman Catholics, modern Roman Catholics, theologians, scholars, would say the same thing. That we are essentially talking about the same thing. The only difference is, is that the Roman Catholics are much more specific about the precise moment at which it happens at which this bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ in all ways except accidental. That's a good Aquinian, Aquinian terminology, in all ways except accidental. The accidents, the accidents of something, it's a, it's, a, it's a technical term. The accidents are something is its molecular structure, what it's composed of. And so if you ran up to the altar and grabbed a wafer after it's been consecrated and ran it and took it and looked at it in the microscope, it's bread. <laughs> you won't find that the molecular structure has changed. It has been transubstantiated in all ways except accidental, which means it's still bread. But in every other way, it has become the body of Christ. Now, the Roman Catholics will say that happens at a particular point. Uh, Anglicans have always said that it is a, the whole sacramental action in the community gathered together. That there's not a point in the service at which that takes place. That's why we don't use sanctus bells, unless it's a real high church. And they really shouldn't be using sanctus bells. <laughs> From organ prelude to organ postlude, it is the whole sacramental action. More about that later. The Roman Catholic Church would not agree with what I'm saying. Just remember that. However, the Anglican Church is Catholic. It is also second hallmark. It is also Protestant. Remember, Catholic, Protestant, and free. Catholic, Protestant, and free. The official name of the American expression of the Anglican Church was for many years, for most of the history of the American Church, the Anglican Church in America, its official name was the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America, which produced the acronym PECUSA, P-E-C-U-S-A. Actually, if you really wanted to get technical, the true formal name of this church was the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. 
But that's, I had to look at that. That's impossible to remember and it produces no acronym and so we never used it. We just called ourselves CUSA. Now I don't know when the name was established but it was been around for a long, long time. Maybe from the founding of the American church. It was late 18th century following the American Revolution. The word Protestant meant at that time something a little bit different than what it has come to mean, at least in the way it is used. At least as the way it was used to describe the formation of the church in the 18th century. It simply meant not Roman Catholic. The word Episcopal means bishop. It comes from the Greek word, New Testament Greek word, episkopos, which meant in secular Greek, meant overseer, like a supervisor. By the 18th century, Puritanism had become a major movement in England. As you all remember that from your elementary study of Thanksgiving, when you dressed up like pilgrims, they were Puritans. They were a significant part of the founding of this country, at least in its earliest days. I'll have a little bit more to say about Puritanism in a few moments, but right now it's important to note that one of the defining things about the Puritans was that they rejected the Catholic order of ministry. Specifically, they rejected altogether the whole notion of bishops even dioceses. That was one of the main points of contention in England between Puritans and the establishment people was the existence of bishops. They were congregational. They wanted a congregational organization of the church. And that's really what made them nonconformists in England. It's really what eventually led to them being outlawed in England because if you press that it undermines the whole authority of the monarchy in England. If the monarch of England appoints the Archbishop of Canterbury and the monarch of England then is the head of the church and exercises that headship through the Episcopal nature of the church to do away with the Episcopal nature of the church does away with the authority of the monarch. So this country, the Anglican Church in this country, prior to the American Revolution, was simply the Church of England on colonial soil. It wasn't anything new. It was simply the Church of England established for the English people who settled this country. Now, in all likelihood, the majority of the people of that church, certainly the majority of the clergy, of that church were royalists. They were loyalists. They probably were not keen about the revolution. They probably were people who were in opposition to the American Revolution. But after the fact, it's a done deal, after the fact, the establishment of an independent nation, there had to follow an independent church. A missionary church from the Church of England to an independent nation, the United States of America, just wouldn't have done. Not in 1780. It just would not have been a very successful thing to do. But it wasn't exactly a different church. It was the same church in a different place. And it was the expression of that church in the context of the events of a particular history in the context of this country at that particular time. And so it was important that it not be called anything that was English. You couldn't call it the Anglican Church of America. Not at that time. But it was also important that it be called Episcopal because it needed to be separated from the whole Puritan influence and it needed to be clear 
that this church was a church that recognized the essential nature of bishops. That this church was the church that was organized around the centrality and the authority of bishops. It was not Puritan. It rejected the Puritan argument. It was Episcopal. So it was called the Episcopal Church, the church with bishops. But it was not the only Episcopal Church, little d. It was not the only church with bishops. The Roman Catholic Church clearly had a presence in this country, especially in certain parts of this new nation. And it would have been accurate to call it the Anglican Episcopal Church in the United States of America, but that wouldn't do. It was the Episcopal Church that wasn't the Roman Catholic Church. And the way you said that was it's the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. It wasn't meant to mean, it wasn't intended to mean anti-Catholic. The word Protestant comes from the root word protest, but it had come to mean by then that which wasn't Roman Catholic. Now, 30 or so years ago, the church officially dropped the word Protestant from its name. It became the Episcopal Church of the United States of America, also known as ECUSA. That was not done without controversy, by the way. Nothing, the, nothing in the Episcopal Church is ever done without controversy. It's one of the hallmarks of the Episcopal Church, is controversy. Now, there were those who saw our identification as being Protestant to be essential to who we are. That was especially true in the South, where we had a history of suspicion and distrust about Roman Catholicism. We didn't want to be Catholic. We wanted to be anti-Catholic in many places. And we had members of the Episcopal Church who thought that to be an important distinction. Now, one of the things that interests me, the reason I'm dwelling on this, is that that controversy was never particularly public. It raged at General Convention. I mean, there were a lot of people who were very upset by dropping Protestant from the name. But you just didn't hear about it much. And one of the reasons, I think, was that those of us who knew about it just ignored it. Nobody that I knew of used Picusa very much. When you talked to lay people in the church, you never heard anybody say, I'm a member of Picusa. I go to a, a Picusa church. It was a technical, political, national church tag, and not very many of the people had much awareness of it. And secondly, it didn't have anything at all to do with sex. <laughs> Dropping the name Protestant from the church had nothing to do with sex. It didn't mean who was going to be involved with whom. And so the public media wasn't interested in it. That's the truth. It seemed to be a rather dull, arcane discussion about things that really didn't make any difference, and so it didn't get much press. And then why bring it up? Why bring it up in a confirmation class where the people are really concerned that we say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church when we recite the Nicene Creed? Why say, well, by the way, we dropped Protestant from our name? Anyway, like it or not, the official name of this church was Ecusa for 20 or 30 years. A few years ago, that evolved into the simpler form, the Episcopal Church. That gets expressed, if you read the literature, TEC, capital TEC. I have not yet heard anyone call it tech. 
Actually, I don't even know if that's an official change or not, but it is what the rest of the Anglican Communion now refers to our church as, the Episcopal Church. I kind of like it. We are the Episcopal Church. We are Protestant, but we are Protestant in the sense of not being Roman Catholic. The Anglican Church is Protestant, but a better word for that, both in terms of meaning and politics, would be Reformed. It is Reformed in the sense of being connected to the central ideals of the 16th century Reformation. It is Reformed in its separation from the authority of the Pope. It is Reformed from the state that the church was in in the 16th century because of that, uh, to, to a large degree, or at least some degree, because of that centralization of authority. In the Anglican church, the central unit is the diocese overseen by a bishop. This is really hard for those of us who come out of the Baptist church to, to intuit. The central unit of the church is a diocese. It is not a parish. The diocese is the central authority in terms of how it worships and how it disciplines itself. That authority is vested in the office of bishop. There is a constitution for our church. That constitution establishes an order of how things are done. There are canons, laws, both at a national level and a diocesan level that create some degree of uniformity, some rules and some regulations, but essentially the exercise of authority, the exercise of that constitution and the canons, as well as the preservation of the faith, the preservation of the order of worship is vested in the bishop. The bishop is governed by the constitution and canons, but there is no individual who is above the bishop of the diocese. There is no one who has authority over the bishop of the diocese. There is collegiality among the bishops of our church. In fact, Collegiality could almost be said to be another hallmark of Anglicanism. Remember I said there might be nine. Like most things Anglican, it is messy and it is hard to define. It isn't something that lends itself to hard and fast rules. It is relational. It seems to work so far. But it requires commitment, patience, and love. Collegiality cannot work without those things. Now the political expression of the national church, the political expression is the, is the general of the Episcopal Church, is the general convention. General convention meets every three years. It is bicameral. There are two houses. Both of those houses are legislative houses. It is analogous to the Senate and the House of Representatives. There's a House of Bishops and a House of Deputies. All bishops, including assistant bishops like suffragan bishops and retired bishops, all bishops are members, voting members of the House of Bishops. The House of Deputies is made up of eight deputies from every diocese in the church, four clergy, four lay people. That means that the House of Deputies has some 900 plus deputies. It is an extraordinarily unwieldy body. <laughs> I've never seen anything quite this bad. <laughs> Legislation, resolutions, canons, all of those kinds of things can originate in either house and they have to be passed by both houses. This all makes sense. But the House of Bishops is more than a political body. In a very real sense, the House of Bishops is the embodiment of the collegiality of the bishops. It meets every year, not just during general convention. 
It often meets just for the purpose of discussion, prayer, and mutual support. The presiding bishop is simply the bishop that got elected to preside over the House of Bishops when they meet. The presiding bishop sits in the chair. It's the presiding bishop who presides. That's why they're called, the presiding bishop is called the presiding bishop. The presiding bishop has some canonical authority in issues of discipline if a bishop runs amok. And this does happen, by the way, even to bishops. If a bishop um, becomes incapacitated or uh, embezzles money or acts out sexually, um, the presiding bishop does have some canonical authority in terms of discipline, but has no authority at all in terms of how a bishop performs in a diocese. The basic unit of the Episcopal Church is the diocese. That is true in varying degrees throughout the Anglican Communion. We are a Reformed Church. We have no Pope. We have no centralized authority. But whether or not that can survive in a world of increasing individualism remains to be seen. Collegiality and mutual respect are not the same things as anything goes. But that becomes less clear in a culture where everyone is in charge, where everyone is individual, individually independent. The rise of talk radio, if you're as old as I am, you can remember a day when there was no talk radio other than that one I can't remember his name, but anyway, you could get him on, if you were driving all night, you could pick it up. But the rise to the talk radio, which is really about 30 years ago or so, but that depended upon the belief that everybody's opinion is of equal value. What matters is not so much what the expert thinks, but what everybody thinks. It is difficult for most of us to vest authority in any other person, especially someone who disagrees with us. That is true even for the President of the United States, much more so for something as remote and esoteric as the House of Bishops. It is difficult for collegiality, which almost by definition requires compromise, it at least requires respect for differing opinions. It is difficult for collegiality to actually work in a culture of narcissistic individualism. And so that's one of the main stresses that this church of ours finds itself in. And the Anglican Communion, the entire Anglican Communion, and the Episcopal Church is finding it difficult to function as it always has. There is an advantage to authority being vested in a single individual or in a single congregation. If you vest authority in a single congregation, that single congregation can then gather like-minded people. And that is its own authority. That authority being invested in the congregation or authority being vested in an individual such as the Pope are really the same kinds of uniformity with opposite expressions. But it's the same thing expressed on opposite ends of the scale. We try to occupy a space in the middle of the scale, the via media, and that is becoming extremely difficult. We will see what will happen, or maybe not. Maybe we won't see what will happen. Things move slowly in the church. And I'm beginning to believe that I probably won't get to see the promised land. 
that that will be reserved for generations to come. There are always some things that we don't get to see, how they turn out. And so I'm not sure that this will get resolved, but I think it may come to a head in the next year or so. Next year or two, there's some things that are, that are perking that may happen that will cause this to raise its head. But our polity, the way in which we are organized, the way we govern ourselves is in itself an expression of being reformed. We have no pope. We are not congregational. The Anglican Church is reformed in its understanding of the primacy of Scripture in determining matters of faith and in its insistence on worship in the language of the people. It is reformed theologically in its acceptance of the Apostle Paul's description of justification by grace through faith. We are brought into a right relationship with God, not because of anything that we do. We cannot be good enough. We cannot give enough. We cannot sacrifice enough. We cannot do anything enough to earn or deserve the love of God. We are forgiven, not because we are sorry enough, not because we make enough amends, not because we apologize often enough. We are loved and forgiven by the sheer grace of God. By the sheer grace of God and God's atoning act of sacrifice on the cross of Christ. We do not deserve it. There is nothing that we can do to deserve it. And that act of grace, God's love and forgiveness, calls us into a new life that develops and grows and lives through faith. The more we trust God's grace, the more we love God. The more we love God, the more we love each other. The more we love each other, the more we seek the justice that love demands. It simply floods. When people say, the more I love people, the more I love God. They have it backwards. The more I love God, the more I love people. The more I trust the love of God, the more I love others. We are justified by grace through faith. We are put in a right relationship with God as absolute gift. That is reformed theology. That is the basis for the Reformation. We are reformed in our understanding of the primacy of Scripture in determining theology. We are a biblical church. I will say a lot more about that probably next week. I'm tired of people saying that they go to a Bible-based church, by which they mean yours isn't. <laughs> we are the most Bible-based church that there is. We are Catholic, and we are Reformed. They are not opposites. We are Catholic, Protestant, and free. Now, the Reformation of the Church of England was essentially a political reformation. We've talked about that at considerable length. I'm not going to say much more about it except to say that Henry VIII had no intention of starting a new denomination. His issue was not theological. His issue was political. Henry VIII insisted that the King of England was in charge of the church in England, not the Pope. The Pope, as far as Henry was concerned, could be in charge of the church wherever else he wanted to be. 
That was other people's business. Henry was in charge of the church in England. Now, it took several years for that really to develop. It not only took several years, it took three more monarchs before what Henry started was finally brought to completion. Brought to completion by Elizabeth in what is known as the Elizabethan Settlement, which finally established the church in England as the Church of England. Under the ultimate authority, of the monarch of England. It still is to this day. Elizabeth was no theologian. History is a little fuzzy on what, if anything, she believed. Elizabeth seems to have believed primarily in pragmatic politics. She was almost certainly not devout. Elizabeth was not someone who carried a rosary around in her hand or prayer beads. And the Elizabethan settlement, if you really look at what the Elizabethan settlement is, it consists of a whole series of acts of parliament that accomplished the establishment of the church in England. It's not a theological document. You can't go look it up. You can't find a book that says Elizabethan Settlement. Actually, you can, but what it is is a collection of parliamentary acts. It was reformed in that it separated from the Pope and in that it established English as the language of worship. It was reformed in that it established worship and the language of the people, but it was fundamentally political. There were, of course, stronger currents of the Protestant Reformation that were swirling in England. Those elements gained power, some power, during the brief reign of Edward VI, who followed Henry VIII. They were squashed by Mary, affectionately known as Bloody Mary. But they didn't disappear. There were executions. Protestants fled the country. But the movement wasn't extinguished. Movements are never extinguished. It went underground. It was stirred and promoted from Europe. By the time Elizabeth came to the throne, and with an increase of tolerance that Elizabeth brought with her, there developed what would come to be known as the Puritan movement. Elizabeth was simply tired of all the brightest and best of English men. And there were women too, actually. But all the brightest and best of the English people being executed by whoever happened to be in power. And so Elizabeth brought with her tolerance. The Puritans gained some traction. The word Puritan, by the way, was originally current, coined as a derogatory name. It was meant to be uh, critical of those who insisted on purity of worship and purity and piety of life. <clears throat> Puritans believed the English Reformation had not gone far enough. They were opposed to anything that was popish in nature. They wanted to do away with wedding rings. They wanted to do away with all statuary, of course. They didn't like stained glass. They sought to abolish the right of confirmation. They wanted to do away with the wearing of vestments. Vestments were not elaborate at all. Following Elizabeth, in the reigns of James I and later Charles I, Puritans would become an object of discrimination, if not persecution. But even in the time of Elizabeth, they were becoming a loud voice. They were adamantly opposed to bishops. They wanted to reorganize the church along more Protestant lines of congregational governance. They rejected the term priest 
but there were clergy in England, even some bishops, who were Puritan, or at least supportive of Puritan ideas. I don't know that Elizabeth cared so much for bishops as being essential to the order of the church. I'm not sure she cared one way or the other, except bishops were essential to the governance of the church by the monarch and she cared a whole lot about that. Into this argument came Richard Hooker. It's hard to prove but perhaps at the invitation of Elizabeth. Richard Hooker was a priest of the Church of England he was a significant scholar, a significant theologian. He was what was known as a high churchman, which meant that he had a high doctrine of church. He was uh, comfortable with the piety of the church. He was comfortable with the polity of the church and with the trappings of the Church of England. Now, interestingly, as these things go, in 1851, Richard Hooker married a woman who was from a Puritan family. He married a woman who was under great Puritan influence. So right off, we have a person of compromise. A person who is opposed to Puritanism who marries a Puritan. I can't remember her name right now. But apparently, we don't have much, he didn't write about his marriage, and we don't have much record of how that marriage worked out, but apparently they got along well enough. They had six children. Uh, so they weren't fighting all the time anyway. And I don't know that the marriage had much to do with it, but Hooker is something of the father of the notion of the via media of the Anglican church as being the way of the middle or the middle road, the compromise place. He promoted the idea of tolerance, and he insisted that theology had to be conducted in a life of prayer, that it evolved, it emerged. He argued that scripture had to be understood in its historical context, the context in which it was written, the history of the time and the events to which it were written, Words, he wrote, must be taken according to the matter whereof they are uttered. You can't understand scripture without putting it in its context. He was most famous, he is most famous for a, a set of books, it was written in seven volumes, a set of books called The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. Actually, I think it's of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. It is primarily an argument for the structure, the order of the Anglican Church as it existed. And it is suggested that he wrote this book at Elizabeth's invitation in argument against Puritanism. Which I find fascinating that the very roots of the Anglican Church lie in the opposition to to intolerance and Puritanism. Now in that book, Hooker establishes one of the foundational principles of the Anglican Church. He talks about authority. How is it that the church acts with authority? How is it that the church speaks with authority? What is our authority grounded on? The reformers, the Puritans, argued the principle of sola scriptura, the Bible only, scripture solely. Now, Hooker said, no, there are three foundations of authority, and they all three have to interact. That scripture is primary in determining issues, matters of faith. But scripture can only be understood through reason by which Hooker meant that which we know to be true, that which is inherent in being human, our reasonability, our ability to think, our rationality would be the better word to use, 
There's a wonderful expression in the 28 prayer book when we talk about being a reasonable holy sacrifice. And we offer ourselves as a reasonable holy sacrifice. I always grew up thinking that meant okay, you know, reasonable. <laughs> Wasn't outrageous. But what it means in Elizabethan English is capable of reason, of capable of thinking. We, we are rational. And that we have to interpret Scripture on the basis of reason, but we have to understand reason and Scripture in the basis, on the basis through the lens of tradition, what the church has always taught, what the faith has always been. But we have to understand what the faith has always been through the lens of Scripture as understood through reason. And yet reason can get us into trouble because we can become so independent in our thinking we can justify anything. And so we have to inform our reason by Scripture and by what the faith has always been. And we go round and round. And people like to call it the three-legged stool of Anglicanism. The leg of Scripture, reason, and tradition. People often quote that, by the way, as saying Scripture, tradition, and reason because there are lots of traditionalists in the church. Hooker said scripture, reason, and tradition. Hooker seemed to be a little bit more suspicious of tradition than we are, which would make sense right out the tail of the, right after the Reformation. And that if you move any one of those, the stool collapses, if you think about a three-legged stool. So, the next three hallmarks of Anglicanism our scripture, tradition, and reason. Scripture, reason, and tradition, and how they're interacted. And we will start with scripture next week. And we may get through uh, more than, it may not take us three weeks to do all of them. We'll see. Thank you. <coughs>